All right. Hello. Welcome back. I think we're on Epi 28 or something like that. I forget the number. I think it's 28. Anyway, way back in episode six, which sounds like a really long time ago, but because I've been making a lot of videos, it's actually like a week, week and a half ago. Uh, back in episode six, we started talking about scheme macros. And so I'd like to talk about those some more. Um, so I've I've consolidated the macros we wrote last time into an epi 0006.scm file. And this is designed to run within the Faster Mini Canron repository, from Faster Mini Canron from Michael Ballantyne. Okay, so... Um, you have to put that file, you know, either in that directory or, you know, somehow you're going to have to load the uh, mini Canron and the MK Vicari compatibility layer. Or you could also do it in Racket. You could easily do an, um, you know, put an RKT wrapper around what we're doing. Uh, so you could do it in Racket as well. Uh, we're doing it in Shea Scheme, but it's basically the same. Okay, so what we did, you know, we were doing macros in the context of Mini Canron because I'm trying to show the real problems that come up with language design and implementation and why you might actually want to use macros. I mean, there are lots of reasons, but trying to give you uh, real world use cases. And so we had a define relation macro there's something similar in the second edition of the reason schemer called defrel for defining relations. And, you know, the, this is a pretty simple macro it just expands to a use of uh, define and Lambda and a fresh. And one of the reasons to have this relation was to prevent a certain class of, of uh, error that was, subtle and hard to debug, where you start by defining a mini Canron relation that has exactly one expression in the body of the Lambda, like a single call to eq equal, for example. And then over time, you add additional goal expressions in the body, and you forget to wrap a fresh around those goals for sequencing or for, for an and or for a conjunction, logical conjunction. And as a result, because Lambda has an implicit begin, only the final goal expression, only the, the goal produced by the final goal expression is actually run by Mini Canron. Everything else is ignored. And that's really hard to track down, especially for someone who's new to Mini Canron. And that happened enough even to experienced Mini Canron programmers, including myself, that is a real pain. The other thing is hiding the Lambda, because in some sense, Lambda is not really part of Mini Canron. So it is true that Mini Canron, the version we're using, is embedded in Scheme, the host language, and Scheme has Define and Scheme has Lambda. However, Scheme allows Lambda to be used in higher order ways. Uh, so you can have a procedure that returns a procedure. You can have a procedure that takes a procedure all those sorts of things. Whereas in Mini Canron, Mini Canron is a, really a first order logic programming language. We have first order syntactic unification. That's what equal equal implements. And so, you know, when you got, got your hands on the value of a procedure from evaluating a Lambda expression, and you think you're, you can play all the scheme games in Mini Canron, that could also lead to confusion. Now it turns out that in practice, you can play some hacky scheme-like games by passing things around. However, you have to be really careful when you do it in Mini Canary. You need to know what you're doing if you're gonna play those games. And I'll probably show you a bunch of those games at some point. But by packaging up a relation using define relation, we can hide the fact in some sense that we're in scheme as our host language and say, well, there's not really scheme here. There's just Mini Canron. Okay, so it's closer to if we had written an implementation of Mini Canron that was standalone. And we don't worry about the lambdas and we don't 
worry about getting into trouble because of implicit begins and all those things. So that's that was the justification for define relation. Also, the syntax is a little shorter. It's a little smaller, more compact. Okay, so maybe a little more abstract. And then also just wrote a test macro because, you know, that's a useful thing to have. Now, obviously, say if you're using uh, Racket, there's Rack Unit, you know. Um, so it's not like there doesn't exist testing harnesses or, or testing libraries, that kind of thing. But what I'm trying to show you is it's not really magic. You can write your own test macro. You know, we could even have side effects like, you know, we could have a global counter that tells you how many tests have passed or how many tests have, have, have failed. Like instead of calling error, instead we could increment a counter, you know, and, and we could, uh, you know, add an error message to a global list or something like that, along with the name of the test. And then you could run a whole bunch of tests. And at the end, you could see how many failed and you could see what the messages are. You could do all sorts of things like that. So, so the idea of the macro is that you can de decide how you want the test, uh, you know, macro to behave. And I, I have defined various versions of test macros depending on what exactly wanted to test and what the behavior was. So, you know, the whole point is scheme allows you to control your destiny when it comes to this sort of thing. Okay. You want, you want to abstract over define and Lambda and, and really make your domain specific language feel like its own language. Okay. You can do things like define relation. If you want to have different types of test macros that can do things like test if an expression um, that is supposed to go into an infinite loop, let's say, uh, test to see if you let it run for a certain amount of time uh, to check to see if it finishes, if that expression evaluates to some value. And if it does, well, then in that case, the test failed because you expect an infinite loop. So I've done things like that where, where I had a certain version of the test ma uh, macro for an expression that I expected to diverge or loop forever. And if I ever change something um, where it stopped infinite looping, they say, okay, well, that was a mistake. I somehow broke something because I expected an infinite loop. So that's an example of maybe a non-standard test case where maybe having a different notion of uh, how the test macro should work would be useful. And, and the nice thing about this test macro is it's fairly simple. We talked about last time and define relation is fairly simple. If you remember the dot, dot, dots mean zero or more occurrences of what's before. And syntactically, these are syntax rules macros. So we have a clause, we have one clause, and then we have um, what's called the pattern. This is the pattern. And then the part below is what's called the template. Okay, so if if um, if a use of the macro of a, of a call to a macro call to define relation matches this pattern, then the result of the macro invocation for syntax rules is going to be an expansion of the template. Okay, that's the basic idea. All right. Um, and, and as another reminder, this underscore actually stands for the name of the, of the macro. So I could put in define relation there. Okay. That's really, what it really looks like is, is a call to the macro or use of the macro. But by convention, you put in underscore. Um, it's because that name is actually ignored by the pattern matching. Okay, and this reminds you this, uh, that the name's ignored, and also it's just easier to read. Um, so that first position, that is equivalent to whatever uh, the name of the macro is. Okay. All right, and then for new test, you know, we don't even have any dot, dot, dots in new test. New test is, is very simple. Just, you know, if, if uh, there's a call to new test that matches that pattern, then the output is this template. The only thing interesting about new test is that we have test expression appear twice. And the first 
appearance is quoted. So if you remember this, we wanted to see what the expression was being tested, not just the value of the expression. So that's why we have it have the quoted version and the and the unquoted version. And then in our format string, or we produce a string that gets passed to error, you know, we have these tilde s's, which are escapes that correspond to these four uh, four arguments to format uh, the, after the format string. Okay, so that was what we looked at, you know, in episode six. Um, all right, and this is what the standard definition of appendo would look like if you were to look at something like, I don't know, um, the Reason Schemer first edition. Um, this might be Kandai instead of Kandi or something, but ba basically in the modern version of Mini Canron, this would be the definition of append. Okay, it would look like that. And we can define append, sorry, appendo. I say append, uh, I mean appendo. Um, we can define appendo using our define relation macro above, and it would look like this. So we have the name of, of the relation, and then we have the arguments, and then we have the body. And, and we could have one or more expressions, and they are wrapped in a fresh. Um, okay, so that that's some, some abstraction. And then we have an example of our test macro. I mean, I call it new test. We could have called it test, whatever. And the uh, test takes the name of the test, an expression, and then, you know, the value, uh, the test expression, and then, you know, the test, uh, the, the expected value expression. All right. So we, we played with all this last time. And let me just make sure it runs. So... Okay. Um, doo -doo. Okay, so we passed. Great. Great. All right. Uh, by, by the way, it's important if you have a file like this, if you're not dealing with, uh, say, libraries, and even, even in libraries, I'm not sure if this matters, but certainly if you're loading a file, these syntax definitions should come as a general rule, they should come at the top of the file. And the reason is you are defining new syntax, okay? And so if if I were to put these expressions that use those macros to the top of the file and try to load the file, I would get an error because define relation hasn't been defined yet, okay? Which makes sense, just like if I tried to refer to some variable foo that hadn't been defined yet. Um, the tricky part is if you try reloading files multiple times, you can kind of get in this weird thing where, um, you know, if you move things around, well, maybe this, maybe the macros have already been defined and then you can move the definitions up. But then when you reload from scratch, you get into trouble. So anyway, the just rule of thumb, stick these macro definitions at the top of your file. If you're using... Um, if you're using the library mechanism of R6, you know, that's uh, packaging things up in a more controlled way. Um, but here we're dealing with a, a top top level file. And, you know, this is this is just to save you time. If you see some message saying that. Uh, well, if you start seeing error messages related to either define relation not being defined or more likely, um, you'll see expressions that are maybe sub-expressions of the syntax, such as, you know, see this list right here, ls, ls. If define relation weren't actually syntax, what this would actually mean is a procedure call. This would be a procedure call, and the rule would be, you know, in some unspecified order, l, S and LS would be evaluated. So these would be treated as variable references. And well, guess what? L is not defined. S is not defined. LS is not defined. So if you evaluated this, actually, let's just try it. Let's try it. Let's just start up Shea Scheme. Okay, I'm not going to load everything. I'm just going to 
Um, I'm just going to try pasting this in. Okay, let's see what the error is. Notice the error. The error didn't say anything about define relation not being defined. Instead, the error was S is not bound. Okay. And so it could have been, for example, that this, this particular S, I don't know, it could have been another S, but this S got evaluated as part of what was considered an application by Shea Scheme because you know, unless it knows, unless Shea Scheme knows that define hyphen relation is special syntax, it will consider define hyphen relation a pers you know. Well, actually, let me put it the other way. Um, <clears throat> in Scheme, the rule is, I should fix my indentation at some point. The rule is if you see parentheses, by default, they mean procedure application. Unless the thing that comes right after the open parenthesis is some sort of of what's called a keyword, if it's a keyword like lambda or or uh, lat or cond or if, okay, fine, then that will be treated as special syntax and with special evaluation rules, that's fine. But otherwise it's treated like a, an, a procedure application. And so that means that the arguments, all, all the sub expressions will be evaluated as if a procedure application so appendo, do a variable lookup on appendo. This right here, ls, ls, that will be treated as a procedure application. And that means that ls and ls will be looked up. If we happen to define ls and ls, if those were, say, globally defined, those variable references would um, produce values. And then l hopefully is a, well, I don't know if it's hopefully or not, but um, you know the procedure application would happen and if L is not a procedure, well, then you get an error, attempt to apply non-procedure, whatever L is bound to. Um, but if L were a procedure, then actually this procedure application would happen. And, you know, the, the value of that procedure application would would be the result of this expression. So, you know, some weird things would happen that, not at all, that are not at all what you intended with define relation. So just notice that the the error message we get is kind of baffling. So if you see this sort of error message, that probably means that define relation isn't actually defined. And if you want to make sure, just try typing in define relation itself, not a call to it, but just by itself. And notice the error uh, message or the exception. Variable define hyphen relation is not bound. Okay, that tells you the macro has not been defined because had the macro been defined, let me define the macro, okay? Now let's see what happens if I do define relation. I still get an exception, but the exception is different. You know, it's really important to look at these, these error messages. The exception now says invalid syntax define relation. So that means define relation is actually defined, but it's syntax and that means you have to use it, in this case, as a macro call. So uh, anyway, the bottom line is put your macro definitions at the top of the file if you're doing this sort of programming to keep yourself out of trouble. All right, so let us load, load it up again. Um, and I actually wanna make a couple improvements or changes to these macros. And I'm gonna show you why. Yeah. Let's look at define relation first. Okay, so this this is going to be a, a minor a minor update to the macro, but look how I defined a, a pendo. So here's the original definition up here with in terms of lambda and define. Okay, and then here we're, here is our define hyphen relation. Okay, and if I want to, by the way, I can go into my .emacs file. And I can look for define hyphen relation, all these things. So if I want to, I can actually say, oh, uh, all right, so I did have that. Uh, maybe I had the wrong indent level. Well, you can, you can update Emacs 
so that Emacs knows how to indent things. So let's let's just try this. Um, see if we can teach Emacs how to indent properly. Okay, that looks like it's better. Let's just try this one more time. Okay, perfect. All right, I just had the wrong indentation. So you can teach Emacs, if you're using Emacs, how to indent uh, your syntax. And I think there's probably a way to make it, the syntax highlighting show up on for the define relation. But in any case, if we look at the definition, uh, this is fine. However, maybe we want alternative syntax. Um, so, so for scheme, just regular scheme functions, there are two syntaxes you can use. So if I, if I wanted to find the function square, I can do it this way. I can say uh, square is uh, lambda n, you know, times n, n, okay. Or I can use an alternative syntax, um, which is sometimes called the uh, MIT syntax. And let's see, I know there's like a way to toggle this. Uh, I don't know. Is there somewhere? It doesn't matter. Um, the MIT syntax, which is, I guess, because you'd see it like an SICP, would look like this. Okay. And so here, uh, after the define, these these parens mean, okay, this is actually a shorthand for define lambda. Okay, define square lambda n. Uh, so these are equivalent. Okay, so, so you can go either way. Um, and actually, you know, quack mode, uh, quack scheme mode can toggle between these if I forget the exact key sequence. Uh, but they're equivalent. So these are the same. <clears throat> and so maybe we want to have an alternative define relation syntax where uh, that you know it'd be like this or maybe we just want to make this the default define relation syntax maybe that's the actual syntax we want okay so um, you know let's decide that this is the syntax we want so if we go back to our, our relation we can see that there's this R, that's the name of the relation, and then the arguments. Just change the pattern. That's it. That's all we had to do. If we wanted to support both syntaxes, we could have two patterns. So we could have um, the pattern that looks like this so the versus the pattern that looks like this. Now, we have to be careful because this R could be anything whatsoever, okay? And these Gs, you know, these expressions could also be sets of parens. I'm sorry, yeah, like they could be, you know, sets of parens. And so you can write, you can write these down in such a way where the syntax is, it's not clear, um, you know, wh which pattern is matched. Now, the, the way it works, the syntax rules is that the patterns are tried top down, sort of like a cond, okay? So if this pattern matches, well, then you get the value of that template or, or, or the behavior, okay? So um, so even if if these patterns overlap, you're still going to match against them top down. But in any case, uh, I don't want to get into you know, overlapping patterns. So let's just define it this way where we'll say, all right, we're gonna have the relation name and then uh, zero more arguments afterwards. And this is gonna be like the MIT syntax. And notice, you know, we define it, you know, we'll expand it out fully. Okay, so that, that's what we'll do. So let's just make sure that works. <clears throat> so this is our new uh, syntax for define relation. You know, this, Kind of a cosmetic change, but may as well uh, kind of make it more compact. Okay, so let's try loading it. <clears throat> okay, make sure our test passed. Yep. Okay, so everything still seems to work. Uh, so that was a little change to the pendo, or sorry, to the define relation. 
Now, there's <clears throat> this, there wasn't really a problem with defining relation. That was just kind of, you know, I want to abstract this and make the syntax a little more compact. But for new test, you know, we actually do have an issue. Um, and I forgot to talk about it last time, but it, this is important to understand. <clears throat> uh, this is very important to understand. So with new tests, let's look at, let's look at our use of new tests also. Okay, so here's our new use of new test, and here's our definition of use test, new test. Okay, so a macro call to new test will have, I'll say new test, and then the name of the macro, which in this case is the string appendo hyphen a b c d e. Okay, and then we'll have a test expression and an expected expression. Now these are expressions, not values. They're expressions. And okay, so that's the um, this is the pattern, and then let's look at the template, which is this whole part below, okay? So that's what we're going to expand to. For the template, what are we doing? So we want to do a test. We want to make sure um, we check whether or not the test expression's value, the value of the test expression, is equal to the value of the expected expression. Okay. Now it's very important <clears throat> that you understand that there is a difference between an expression and a value in scheme. So here we have an expression plus three, four, whose value is seven. Okay. So we'd say that that evaluates that expression plus three, four evaluates to seven. There's a distinction between the expression and the value. Okay. Um, I can make this, uh, I mean, I can also do something like quote the plus, uh, plus three, four. Okay. So we get back a data structure representing that. And I can call eval to evaluate that quoted expression. And I get back seven. So, you know, we evaluate that expression. We get the value back. That's important. We understand that. So if I do something like say, if equal um, plus three, four to times three, four. Okay. If that's true, let's return, quote, uh, return the symbol same, otherwise different. Okay. It's important to understand that this call to equal question mark is taking two expressions. Okay. So we have the equal question mark. Okay. Uh, let me be careful. <laughs> let me be careful. All right, this is why you read the, um, the report and try to be very careful with their concepts and with your terminology. Here we have an expression. Okay. If we start from the outside, we have an outer expression, which is an if expression following the rules of scheme evaluation. We check to see if the first thing after the open paren is a keyword, and it is, it's the keyword if. Okay, so it's telling you that if is special syntax and can have special evaluation rules. And so the evaluation rules of if are evaluate the test expression. If the test expression produces a true value, that is any value other than hash f, then evaluate the consequent expression, otherwise, evaluate the alternate expression. Those are the rules, okay? Now, the test expression for the if is itself an expression. This, uh, we, we follow the same rule. So what, what comes immediately after left-hand paren, is it a keyword? No, it is not, okay? So that means that this overall expression is a procedure application. By default, parens mean procedure application unless the thing following left paren is a keyword. This is a procedure application, okay? The rules for evaluating a procedure application is that in unsu some unspecified order, all of the sub-expressions within that application, or sorry, within that within the parens get evaluated. So this, this expression gets evaluated right there, the times three, four, the plus three, four gets evaluated, 
the equal itself gets evaluated. That variable reference gets evaluated. And so let's say Shea scheme decided to start with this expression. Okay, so this will itself be another procedure call. We follow the same rules, you know, uh, the thing right to, you know, immediately to the right of the left of the opening paren is not a keyword. So this is another procedure application. So you, you follow these rules recursively. You know, this expression three evaluates to the value three. It's a self-evaluating uh, expression. Four, the expression four evaluates to the value four. The expression plus, well, this is a variable reference, evaluates to a procedure that can add numbers. And the same thing here. And then once the procedure bound to plus is called with the arguments three and four, then this gives back seven, evaluates to seven. And similarly, here we get 12. This variable reference for the equal question mark will evaluate to a procedure that can, that will take two arguments and compare them and return either hash T or hash F. So it's a predicate. So anyway, there's this complicated, it's actually not that complicated, but this was recursive mechanism by which these are evaluated. And it's important to re remember that we have an expression here and we have an expression here. So it, when you look at this, Okay, that expression is different from the number seven. Okay, the seven is the value of that expression, but the expression itself is plus three, four. And similarly for the times. Okay, so it's very important that we keep that distinction in our mind when we try to understand what's happening with the macro. Now we can tell, <clears throat> we can tell when we uh, have a use of the macro. Let's, let's go ahead and expand uh, this use of new test. And that will probably help us figure out what's going on. So let's expand it. Okay, we got all these gen sims. Print uh, gen sim hash f. Let's try to make it print gen sim hash f. Okay, expand it again. Okay. Uh, it's kind of complicated, so let's let us um, make it simpler. So let's do, so let's say, we'll call this the name. And then this is, let's say the test expression. And this is, um, well, Dan Friedman likes this trick where you say, okay, the test expression is one, the expected expression is two. So let's just see what this expands to. Okay, so this is a trick where you know, when you have some macro expansion that's really complicated, you can try to boil it down. All right, so here's what what uh, our test macro actually expands to without the gen simming. If one is equal to two, then return pass, otherwise this error. And then notice we have the one, one, two here. All right, so let's make these expressions a little more complicated. So let's do what we were doing before. I'll, tell, I'll say uh, three, um, let, me, let me change the numbers just to make it easier to file, follow what's going on, okay? So now we have these two expressions. We have the test expression, and we have an expression with the expected value. Now let's see what the um, expansion looks like. Okay, here we go. If equal uh, the addition of two, uh, three, four to the multiplication of five, six, then passed, otherwise call error, and then we have the format, and then we have the quote plus three, four, we introduce that quotation, or we're gonna add three, four, and uh, multiply five, six, okay? All right, great. Well, that's what we expected, but here's the important thing. Notice, even though when you add three and four, you get seven, the, the equal test is not on the number seven, it's on this expression, which is going to add three and four. And furthermore, down here, when we want to print out the value in the, uh, or sorry, when we have create a format string that we pass the error, we evaluate the addition of three to four. So this is duplicate. We, uh, we have the same expression appearing twice and being evaluated twice. So we have the expression, which is adding three and four here, and, and also down here, okay? 
So we've duplicated the expression in the same with five, six, five multiplied by six and five multiplied by six. And furthermore, um, you know, the, the quoted version of plus three, four is appearing here. Now, now this isn't being, you know, we're not evaluating uh, the addition. Okay, so, uh, but that, that syntactically, uh, we're getting that expression again, okay? So, so the, this uh, plus three, four ends up in the output three different ways, or sorry, three different times. One as the expression plus three, four that gets evaluated to a number, one, another plus three, four, and then the quote plus three, four, okay? So when this code gets run, what's gonna happen is uh, we're gonna do, you know, scheme will do the procedure call and try adding three and four and that will work. And then the equal test will happen and, you know, the seven will be compared to the 30 and um, the error will be called and the call to format will happen. And then, you know, quote plus three, four just gives you a list three, four, but here we add three and four again. And here we multiply five and six again. So we have a duplicate evaluation of this expression and a duplicate evaluation of this expression. Now, if our program is purely functional, that's not a problem necessarily. Uh, however, imagine if instead of being purely functional, if, if this expression removed money from a bank account, right? Or moved a robot, moved a robot arm 20 degrees. Now you're moving the robot arm potentially twice instead of once because you're is being evaluated twice. The other problem that can come up with is, or that can happen is when you have macros that are expanding like this and you have duplicated expressions, especially if the macro has, you know, nested macros or recursive behavior, you can get this explosion and, you know, you get this exponential explosion, explosion in code size. So like imagine if um, this were some macro call and that itself is going to get expanded. Um, and, uh, you know, now we've replaced that expanded macro call twice, that kind of thing. Um, you know, let's see if we can, let me think. Uh, so can I, can I produce something like that? Mm. Well, maybe we can do it. So let's see if I say expand, how about maybe an or? Um, yeah. Okay, so so notice how exp how or expands to to all this code, right? Um, and then if I also had an or here, you know, I can, you know, I can I can very easily start like blowing things up if I were to keep repeating uh, these sub expressions, right? So if I keep having these repeated sub expressions over, I'm just going to copy the same sub expression over and over again. You know, now it's like going off the page. Okay, so so we can get up these gigantic expressions, uh, and that can use a lot of memory and be slow to compile and all those sorts of things. And and in worst case, you can get exponential behavior. Uh, so it's sort of like a denial of service attack against your compiler in a way. Um, okay, so. This this is a problem, and so uh, there's a there's a simple technique though to have to have uh, get around this problem. But it's an important technique that you understand, and and the idea is to do a let binding. So um, instead of you know just having the same expression appear in the expansion in the template twice and be evaluated twice, well, we can just have a let expression on the outside of this if and give a name to the value of the expression and then just use that name, just have a variable reference appear multiple times, okay? It's just to just to avoid the multiple evaluation and then to avoid the, um, you know, uh, potential exponential blow up of code. So let's go back to our, um, our definition of the macro. 
to the new test. Okay, and so I'm going to call the newer one, uh, I call it newer test, newer test. Okay, so let's do newer test. And so what we're going to do, so we're going to do a let binding. We're going to have two bindings here for the let. And so we're going to want the test expression. Whoops. Eh. Sorry, I'm being a, ah, I'm noobing it up with my Emacs. Here we go. Okay, and then the expected value expression. All right, so let's say this is the test value and this is the expected value. Okay, let's just give them those names. And now we're not gonna compare the test expression, we're gonna compare the evaluated value TV. And we're gonna compare that with the expected expressions value, okay? So the idea is that the let will force evaluation. And now we just give a name to, to the results of those evaluations, and then we can just use those variable references. And now down here, so this is TV, and this is EV. Okay, great. Now, the only thing we have to remember is that we actually want in the format string the original expression to be quoted. We don't want the value, we want the expression. So we still better have quote, because we don't want quote of seven, we want quote of plus two, three. I mean, plus three, four or whatever, okay? So that's the idea. All right, so now, now that I've defined a newer test, so let's try, um, let's say we have newer test as a version as well. Okay. Okay, so we fixed up those definitions. All right, so let's first of all make sure it works. Okay, that worked. And now let's expand this. Let's do the same expansion we did, the simplified expansion, just because it's easier to read. And so we're gonna do the same uh, expand as above. Let me just grab it. And I'll just change it to be newer test instead of new test. And let's see uh, how it differs. Okay, so now you can see there's a let. And so you say let TV be the result of that call, the plus three, four, and then let EV be the result of that call. And then, okay, we have TV and EV we're comparing. And then in, for a format string, we have TV and EV. So we do not repeat um, those expressions. We do repeat the plus three, four in the sense that, you know, we, we, we need both the value and in this case, we need the expression. But, you know, because we want the expression, that's what we have to deal with. Uh, now, if we wanted this list, you know, we could, if we wanted to, like say we wanted to have uh, that list, the quoted list appear multiple times and we didn't want the code to, to blow up. Uh, we could also do it this way. We could say, you know, we could say, um, you know, TE is quote of test expression. And this is, whoops. Let's see, I think I, I think I got this right. Let's see if I am not being a noob again. Okay. All right, so I think that works. Let me just reevaluate the macro. All right, let's try expanding it again. Okay, I think that's right. So let's just make the test, uh, the, let's just run the test instead of expanding it. And we should get an error, so let's see if it worked. Yep, expression, whatever. Okay, so that's that worked. So if we wanted for some reason um, to have the quoted expression appear multiple times, once again, we wouldn't be blowing things up exponentially. Um, we could avoid that. We just you know, look up the variable TE each time. So uh, that's a very important trick and, and that's a, an issue you need to know about when dealing with these macros because you know, if we're expanding to code, um, first of all, you can end up with multiple 
the expression evaluated multiple times, which may not be what you want. And also you can end up with this code blow up. Okay, so you'll often see this let trick used or let technique used in um, the template of a macro. Okay, so important you understand that. That's a thing to do. Um, yeah, so I think that's enough for right now. Um, we were working our way up to an alternative run interface, but I think we've, we're 45 minutes in, so I think this is plenty, plenty to talk about. Um, we can talk about the alternative run interface and different versions of that uh, next time. All right, thank you very much. Talk to you soon.